Welcome to the One Lap Heroes podcast, because what the world needs now is another automotive podcast. Welcome everyone to episode four of the One Lap Hero podcast. Um, this is a bit of a different one as we will not talk cars, or rather, that will not be the main uh, the main topic. Uh, but, uh, Costas, what are we going to be talking about? I have this special plan for today. It is something that is almost uh, as often being asked as what type of car I should buy. It is uh, how do I come and race at the ring, or uh, more often, you know, like how do I, be, I become like a professional racing driver. And what we are actually going to discuss today is how you actually arrive to being a paid racing driver because yes. uh, I have I have, a, I have a very important thing here that I want to clarify and I will take I will take the difficult <laughs> the difficult road of clarifying this okay. so Gab doesn't have to look bad so all your friends uh, that you follow like on Instagram you know friends uh, that they have like the racing in the title of their Instagram accounts you know and they are pretending that they are racing at the ring the majority of them, they're like customers. So they Correct. actually go to a team, they book a race seat, and they do a race. Which, actually, there is nothing bad about it. It's actually a fantastic thing. And later in this podcast, we are actually going to discuss how important are the gentleman racers. Because I guarantee you that without of the, some of them, racing as we know it would not exist. So gentleman drivers are very important. Later on, Gab will actually give you like some inside, like really, really inside, inside the knowledge on this. But... Uh, the problem is not being a customer. The problem is all these people, you know, like they have these Instagram accounts full of uh, racing photos, uh, which might all come like from one race or two races <laughs> that they do per season, <laughs> you know, and they have these accounts and they try to portray like a different image. Uh, the real cool people that are out there racing and they are paying to race, they, they normally they don't act like this. Uh, that is like one thing. So these people, the XX racing and whatever is uh, on their titles or something, something motorsport or whatever, that they tend to pretend that they have like a business these are not like paid racing drivers so that is that i take i take it on me so gab doesn't have to say by the same uh, by the same by the same account uh, uh, the vast majority of coaches are not coaches either <laughs> Co correct. And also, by the way, since we are discussing different professions, uh, the majority of photographers, I'm not uh, photographer. big, big logos, big logos and the big photography thing, uh, they are not really, they're not really, really pro. But uh, I, actually, actually this, is, this is interesting because this, um, uh, because of course I have perspective on my field. So, uh, but I, it is obvious that they exist on several levels and in several uh, in several different fields. I mean, if the job is cool, there is people pretending to be doing it, I think. Um, For sure. Which there is a degree of, uh, I think we will discuss a bit, a bit more later, but there is certainly a degree of fake it until you make it. So uh, <clears throat> I'm not entirely uh, against this to the, to some extent, but... Uh, there is, I there am has, a little bit. Uh, but I there, understand there, it, there but has I am to, a little but bit. But there, there has to be some actually doing it. Uh, well, you, it's like like you, can, uh, you can make it a little bit looking a little bit better than it is but you have to be at least something so there is plenty of uh, plenty of them that actually have limited to zero experience in racing and actually don't do almost any racing at all <clears throat> and and yet they portray themselves as professional racing ever recently i came across a youtube video saying this is how i got my porsche contract uh, to drive a gt3 and uh, it, is a, it is just it is just a very it is just a very famous youtuber that managed to pay his way to drive a cup car in as a customer so it's not even a gt3 car so it's called gt3 because it's uh, it's it's a gt3 cup car um so that the and and but he's clearly paying like he's clearly paying for it and uh, he's you know <laughs> but and, and I, but I, the, the the video the title of the video is this fantastic. is how I managed I to get I a I Porsche my GT3 dream job. contract my and dream job dream job, dream job. Yeah. I will be racing for Porsche yes uh, and it is a bit funny uh, guys we <clears throat> discussed about this early in the video so actually the rest of the video can be helpful and can have like information but most of these people it's a bit sad at least from where I stand, because what they actually do, like even in their customer side of the experience, is actually fantastic. And even the small guys, you know, that they do like a couple of VLNs or a couple of RCNs, if you present it as it is, it's actually a very cool thing. Uh, you do you do VLN in a small car, That's absolutely fantastic. Actually, we're gonna come into this later, uh, later in the video. The guy that does V4 uh, in a competitive BMW and it's out there fighting with other people and he's doing like some proper, proper racing. I respect uh, him much more than the tourist more... and farting uh, guy. 
Correct. Absolutely correct. So uh, the reason that we are discussing this with Gab is uh, because I personally think that uh, his uh, success story in a way is fantastic. It's a, it's a little bit the dream of many of us. You know, uh, you arrive at the ring, you try to, to, to hustle your way into what is your dream. Uh, maybe even one that you, you didn't really believe that was within reach at some point. You work very hard. Actually, I have seen you from the, from the sidelines, you know, like actually work very hard. And this is why I would, uh, I would like you to tell a little bit your story. Normally in these podcasts, we take like opposite roads, you know, like I, I, I'm on one side, you're on the other side, and we're sort of discussed. But this is going to be a bit more about you. So okay. I want to ask straight with a question. Um, for many people, and I think this is going to be also very, very useful. For many people, they think that you basically came to the ring and then like one or two seasons after you ended up in a race car. And uh, that was that and uh, everything, everything went from there. But I know very well that this is not completely the truth, like in the sense that you did racing in a different way earlier on. Uh, so what was your first first experience doing racing? Uh, karting? Yeah, so while my, uh, you could say, uh, race to fame was never being based, uh, actually I was a legitimate race driver beforehand. Uh, I started very young, uh, as with many. Actually, many of my conscripts eventually ended up to do great things, including uh, Formula One and whatnot. So. We were all a bunch, uh, a bunch of tools together, uh, having fun at go kart tracks, and um, basically. Can you name yeah. names? Uh, I much rather not. I, I'd rather not do it. Uh, but uh, um, some of the, like you know them, like uh, some of them that are around my age. Uh, so by the time I was there, like of course, like for example, people like even uh, I managed to see even um, like the very the very late days of uh, Trulis karting, for example. Um, but then, uh, together with me, there are many Italian, many Italian drivers that are factory drivers here and there, and uh, they had their stints in Formula One and whatnot. They, they actually, you know, we were all together. Like I remember, for example, like uh, my father used to go and pick up uh, um, uh, lotterers uh, at the airport. Uh, for example, he went on to do much better things than I did. Uh, but no. <laughs> obviously, no, but, no, no, uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, but no, no. But what I'm saying is that we were all together. I started very young. I started when I was eight, and uh, by uh, in those days, the earliest you could go racing was ten. So we all had fake IDs to go racing at eight. Um, this is how we rolled then back in the days. So uh, we were we were 10 years old uh, three times, three years in a row for, for some reason. We managed to say 10 years old for three years. Um, yeah, it was fun days. Like uh, eventually, like I started as a, as a kid, but then I, I was quite okay with it. I was quite okay with karting. And um, uh, together with uh, together with my father, uh, like like of course when you're that young eventually it only comes from your family uh because you 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 know somebody has to put <laughs> somebody has to put some money in um uh, and back in the days like starting as a kid i think it's still quite quite accessible to some extent uh so there is a chance for many and it was the same for me i did well when i when i was cutting i didn't really have the I had the speed, but I never had the consistency, so I would make many mistakes, and uh, I would be very emotional, and uh, it would be very difficult. And uh, like, it's always uh, depends. So for me, like for example, I had like a little bit of a difficult relationship with my father back then because there were like expectations, because of course he was putting a lot of money, um, all of his resources there, and when he sees me fuck up something very simple or. Uh, uh, when you are maybe you are 13 or 14 and you just want to text with with the girl and you don't care about the go kart race because sometimes that happens and he's uh, and he's throwing all he has in, <laughs> in it. I can guess this can become a little bit frustrating. But anyway, karting eventually everybody starts from the same place, uh, but uh, the guy eventually is like a pay to w it is eventually. A pay to win uh, thing uh, the more you spend the more you win it's pretty much that simple um, because even though of course there are possibilities to compete with lower budgets eventually it's just a matter of how much you test and no matter or just a matter of how good the material you have especially if you go to very high level so i did some very high level international races when i when i when i could do well but I was never really there with my head and uh, as I said, I would do mistakes and eventually it reached to the point that 
um, I mean, I reached a point where basically my family said, my or rather my father said, you know, there are 50 guys in the class with you and 40 of them are pretty much within two tenths of each other. So you all have the same talent uh, and um, I don't really have the money to give you the material to, to get the extra tenth or the extra two tenths that you need to win because we are talking about already then, back then, we're talking about like uh, a lot, a lot of money. And he said, I don't see any reason to keep spending uh, like average budgets or, or spending all I have uh, to, you know, to struggle another one, two years and then coming out with nothing. So uh, I think basically he put it this way, like I don't have enough resources to push you through to get to the, to the next step where you need to be uh, to, to go forward. So it makes no sense to keep going. So let's do something else. Uh, and then, uh, of course, it was very difficult because we had many years in, invested in this thing. And for me, this was my life. But um, but yeah, it, it is a wake up call because eventually you realize there is other stuff in life. And uh, and this is where this is when I stopped. Uh, I don't remember exactly when I stopped, uh, but uh, it was a long time ago. So I stopped for a while. So my cutting career stopped, and uh, then I basically just. For me, I just turned a page in the sense that uh, it was very painful to be exposed to it. So I stopped following races. I stopped following cuttings. I stopped all my friends that I had in cutting. I stopped seeing them. Uh, so it was I like completely changed my life completely. I said, okay, this is a chapter that is closed and and uh, let's move on. And this was, a, this was a, how I lived for a while. So like I didn't care about racing at all. I can understand that this could be very difficult, especially at a young age. No? Yeah, but at that age, you know, it's very difficult because you, it's not your decision. Uh, so no matter how, no matter how much you, you force yourself to try and understand, it's never your decision. Somebody else is taking the decision for you. Gab, uh, I think I think we're going to come into it later on because uh, also one of the things that I want us to discuss is that even even when you are there, even when you think that you have arrived. Uh, one of the the worst things about doing this as professionally is that everything at any point can change. And yeah. uh, I think people don't realize how often many of these kids, you know, uh, they they have the potential. They might be like one one season away from being found, you know, like one contract away from getting uh, from karting to F3 or like a, another single seater series. And I find this particularly interesting because when you hear, uh, especially like like drivers that have done extraordinary things in their careers, you know, like, I don't know, I was reading recently about uh, Tom Christensen, and then uh, we were discussing the other day about uh, Michael Krum when he was in Japan, like, he was thinking that his career would be finished. Uh, drivers like Jason Plato, you know, like, uh, we often discuss about his case, you know, like, if he didn't get the contract uh, uh, to do Re Renault, to do this, he would not have the touring car career that followed. Yeah. Like, all these all this, this key moments, you know. For, but those are every... already late in life. Those are already late yeah. in your career. So, like... Uh... To get to the point, to get to the point that you get something like this, so like to get to the point that you get a chance to do something, uh, and then you decide uh, and you go to the you go the wrong direction, uh, it is still it is a regular a regular occurrence in a sense that it happens to many, uh, and many many ruin their career uh, doing this, and many made their career doing it, doing it, um, but eventually. I think that is already a later stage in the sense that you are already at a stage where you are evaluating your options and not like uh, going for whatever you can get. <laughs> so, uh, which is a different, uh, which is a different stage in life. So like if I, of course, if you are in a position where they are offering you, of course, now it's a bit, you know, the road, the, the road has been paved, but if in the nineties or if in the mid eighties, you would have had to pick a formula 3000 in Europe or Formula Nippon in um, in Japan, very few would have gone for Formula Nippon because they knew that European teams, Formula One teams, would be looking in Europe. But eventually, Japan was a very was a very good market where you could where you could grow your career there. Lottery, lottery is once more an example there. He made for his sure, career for also sure. in Japan. For sure. Uh, back to our topic. So you are there. You close this chapter of your life. Uh, yep. You realize that there are other things in life, and you are ready to sort of live a little bit again your teenage years. And uh, how how cars come again back into the picture? So of course, you um, no matter how how hard you try, you know, like if you if you are really passionate about something, the the, the spark is always there, and it, you just need a little bit of paper to make a big fire. Um, and uh, this is pretty much what happened to me in the sense that uh, 
it is a very funny story. I don't know if we ever spoke about this actually. And one day, like uh, I was out with my friends, and they said, "Oh, let's do something different tonight. Let's go. Uh, you know, there is a go kart track here. Let's go." And I said, "Ah, okay, cool." And I said, uh, "But they, they told me like they knew a little bit that I did some, uh, but I." I'm always been. I have never been a guy that wants to talk about his uh, his thing. Like uh, like even now when people say, "How do you do? You do racing?" So like even today, I had the the, the suit with like I had the, the 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 sweater with saying like with the name of the team, and I said, "Ah, you're doing racing?" And then I say, "Yeah, I'm a mechanic." Like uh, <laughs> I don't <laughs> I don't want to be there and talking about my racing uh, with people. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> I find it just. Don't worry. Like, there is only there is only a thousand or two thousand people watching this. So this is uh, no no for continue. sure. <laughs> but this is something because for me this is something very private. Like I racing fully for understand. me is, is a private Actually, experience. Actually, I experience to me in my in my normal life I don't speak about cars because uh, I normally don't want to speak cars with people that, uh, that they are not like in yeah. that hardcore into into what we do. Correct. So I understand easily how you you don't avoid this. But but but. Yeah, so uh, so my mates say, okay, cool, let's go tonight uh, go kart track, and they said, let's see. Uh, you told us you were karting when you were young. Let's see you were still if you are still good or not. And of course, it's uh, you know you go to this track with four-stroke rental cars that are bullshit. And uh, but I go there and um, I go there. And I, I get in and I I'm having fun. So I do my race, of course. My friends are all useless uh, because it's like not useless in the in the not useless yeah, on, nah. not useless <laughs> on absolute terms. But if you, I want to put something in perspective. Is like I'm a, I am five a, seconds away. I am a very keen cyclist. I am a useless cyclist. So like compared to somebody that does it well, I'm useless. And no matter how good I think I am, I'm useless. And this is uh, what happens when I compare when I happen to go in places where a normal guy that doesn't have to do anything with motorsport has a chance to compare directly to me. So he might think he's a good driver, but he doesn't even know what driving is. Uh, to the same extent that I might consider myself a good cyclist, but I don't even know what cycling really is if, if I compare myself to a world tour rider. Uh, same thing. Um, and um, yeah, so they were useless, uh, but I had some fun um, you know, playing with them. And then when I was there, like this is uh, again completely coincidental. And the evening I was there, uh, there was somebody from the track there and said, "Ah, you're going very fast. Uh, I've never seen you here." And I said, "No, it's the first time I've been here. Uh, I've never been here before." I said, "Ah, this is really good. And uh, we, you know, we have uh, we have a championship where you can uh, when you can come and uh, you know it costs so and so, and uh, you can come and have some fun. And uh, we have endurance races here and there. And so it started again. So." Uh, so it started again with cutting and then uh, with with this this silly races and then uh, from then on it never stopped uh, basically again. So then I got myself um, uh, with a few money that I have I got I got myself a Lotus because I liked it and then with this Lotus I went and did some amateur races uh, basically mostly time attack and there the same thing happened like uh, they thought they had they, I mean of course I go there and the first time I go there. I am already faster than the people doing it for years, and it it was completely normal to me in a sense that they didn't know, but I had 10, 12 years of experience. <laughs> so the first time I went into a car, I already had 12 years of experience in motorsport. This uh, is where I wanted to arrive, by the way. So this is what I want to explain to people so because this sometimes is... people people think that this is just a, you know like a random thing that you jumped in a BMW during VLN and you did that and it, it just happened. And no, it, it doesn't. It's a happen. little it doesn't. a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more complicated, and it actually gets even more complicated than it is then then I then I say it because uh, I never was like a particularly big uh, talent in a, in on itself uh, in a sense that uh, I've never been the guy that uh, I've seen them so especially when they were young and uh, I still see that they today some of them uh, that do stuff that doesn't make any sense but uh, the lap time is there and uh, and uh, this this existed and it will exist forever uh, but these are very few examples and for for everybody else they they have to work. So uh, if I just uh, sat on the go kart and uh, and did nothing, I probably would have been completely average. And uh, but I knew that being average was not good enough. So I did I did a lot of work and I worked a lot. I always been a hard uh, self critic. So I when I even wanted when even when I was young, I'd put a lot of effort into try and understand what I could do to go faster. 
And I hope people are paying attention to these things uh, because this is a, a very important thing. And this maybe helps you understand a little bit why many times in this channel you you'll hear us being critical about everything, about labs that you might think that they are perfectly okay, we will not be happy. Yeah. About cars that you will think that they're perfectly okay, we will not be happy. And uh, I guarantee you that uh, behind everyone that does something to a very high level, and I don't even try to say that we do something to a very high level, but we have been around these people. Uh, you clearly see this specific trait, trying to analyze, trying to find mistakes, trying to do this. You don't do it like that. You don't excel in cycling, in basketball, no matter in, what, uh, car no matter racing, what. in karting, whatever. Uh, continue. So, uh, so I, since uh, since very young, since in go karting, I always had uh, a keen, let's say, interest into understanding why somebody was fast. Uh, like because, of course. Eventually, bottom line, uh, we all have two arms and two legs and uh, one set of eyes. So as long as you have, actually, some of them were fast even without two arms. So, uh, <laughs> so basically, you can see Kubica now is still a fast race driver and he basically drives super with one fast, hand. Super fast. I, I believe one of the most impressive things was how fast he was in his return uh, at that high level of a car. Yeah, yeah, because of Formula course, One. Uh, yeah. um, okay. And... Uh, Basically, eventually, it it came apparent that uh, it it was a little bit like maybe it even spoiled a little bit the romantic side of karting, and to me, it still sp somehow it still spoils the romantic side of driving. And this is why I, it can be a bit of an underwhelming experience to talk to me about driving, because everybody is talking of talent and fast and this and that, but. In reality, it's all bullshit. You know, it's just hard uh, work. Hard fucking work. You just <laughs> but, have to do execute the execute but, the mission. There is a several there are a set of things that you have to do at a set of <laughs> a set of things that you have to do at a certain time in a certain amount of uh, intensity. And if you do them, it's fast. It's like no magic, no <laughs> bullshit, no talent. Two it's things. Like, two things. Two things of this. First of all, the romantic part of driving. This is what the Wallop heroes are uh, here doing for you. Yes. This is my personal mission in life. Is I see a lot of a appreciate. lot of romantic driving when I see you are driving. <laughs> <laughs> Correct, because I still enjoy it, motherfucker. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to tell you something. I have to tell you something. Uh, one of my personal missions is to get you to enjoy cars. You know, in a different way <laughs> than you do. Because what what the people don't know is that uh, you normally Gab will have like a race weekend driving cars that uh, for, uh, for us is almost dream machines, you know, like just having the opportunity to drive them. And of course, I understand that the moment you are there and you are driving these cars for a, for a specific reason, you cannot be romantic about it. You cannot say, ah, oh, I'm in a Cayman GT4 race car or I'm in a Carrera Cup race car because you are there to do a very specific thing. And if you cannot do that specific thing that you are there to do, the fact that you are in this car is irrelevant. Okay, maybe it's exciting the first time that you go into it. Uh, so speaking to Gabo after a race weekend is actually one of the funniest things in the world <laughs> because for the last five, six years, he has not been happy, not even <laughs> once, not even once. And I'm not joking. And I include that. I include things like, you know, like uh, like temporarily leading the 24-hour uh, race overall or, you know, like winning your class for the first time in the 24-hour Nürburgring 24-hour or even winning the 6-hour here, you know, like the next race that you can win after the 24-hour race is like the 6-hour VLN race. Winning this overall, you were not happy. <laughs> okay, I mean, maybe that, uh, that day you were a little bit more relaxed, but... Uh, at the same time, I fully understand why not and uh, why there is no no mystery. And it's the same. Uh, it's perform. the same story with you. Like you, I've never seen you happy with a video you made. Absolutely no, no. I fully understand. And I, I, I believe that the same for athletes like uh, Michael Jordan. You know, like uh, people will say that uh, the guy is. Uh, intolerable and uh, he's a horrible person or whatever but for him when he's out there he's the problem is that he's not playing basket so it is a matter he's not enjoying the game exactly correct. he's not he's there not like probably, uh, throwing yeah. throwing balls with his pals uh, exactly it, absolutely so. the opposite. there is a time he's for it like when I, there is a time for us so eventually it's funny that you mentioned because you see even like a formula one drive i can guarantee you a formula one car is fucking epic like i can guarantee you to give me the worst formula one car is Epic to and drive. Epic. And yet they regularly say this car is a piece I of shit. I cannot drive this thing. I cannot drive this thing. <laughs> this car is a total you... piece of junk. <laughs> Which of course it is not, but relevant re relatively to what they need to do. 
uh, it is in that instance. And I've been there many times saying, uh, how can you complain? You're living the dream, like a factory driver here doing but that. But you clearly and, uh, can't complain. But of course, uh, the car is under steering like a pig. And I, I'm, S- I'm a small, small tangent, small tangent, by the way, since we're talking about F1 cars, uh, we're briefly going to say this, uh, because it connects with what we were talking before, you know, like about speed and it's no, it's no black, black art and it's a, it's a very specific thing. Uh, something very important a lot of people, like I would say that almost every car group, they have like one of these guys, you know, that they, he thinks that he's fast. And if you put it collectively, you know, like there are like literally hundreds of these people. And if you put collectively, there are like thousands in every city and probably yeah, thousands yeah, in every country. Uh, and all these people, they are fast. They are not completely, completely wrong, like in their head. And one of the most common things that, uh, that we get when we speak with people, the first thing they would say, I, like, I'm fast. Uh, I have to be in a race car. And... Uh, <laughs> And I want you to touch a little bit on this. First of all, how far normally that fast, you know, like, like I'm fast in a road car on the road or like I'm fast with my, my specific track car on this specific racetrack, how far this fast is from the fast that we're talking. And the second thing, like out of being a race driver, you know, how much important is the, the fast part, you know, and how much is all the rest of the things required to arrive there and to stay there? Right. So, so we, we, are cl- we are clearly taking a pause from my history. Uh, yeah, 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 of course, of course. Okay. Uh, because also uh, there's this. Also, because I, I hope we don't talk about it anymore because it is not, uh, I think, <laughs> no. what's so interesting. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, so to the point uh, that you were talking about, uh, this is uh, something that uh, people that have talked to me about this, they all got the same answer, which is uh, you being fast is a, a, a requisite. So it's not like, it's not like, it's like saying. Um, uh, it's like wanting to be an Olympic swimmer and say, I can swim. I swim. I float. I float. Yeah. I float. <laughs> you know, yeah. Thank God you do. Because otherwise, what are you doing? So like uh, you being, you, you could be the fastest guy ever existed. Uh, um, although this is a, this is completely a, a, like a, like an empty concept in a sense that Lewis Hamilton is clearly the most capable driver currently in Formula One. But he, he is, you can only say that he's the fastest guy he is, and I am a big fan, but you can only say that he's the fastest with that machinery on that day. So, and on, on those years. So if you take him, if you take Lewis Hamilton and you put it in on, into an AMG GT3 on the Nordschleife, is I can guarantee you, is not competitive to the level of winning a 24-hour It's a different hour principle, race. basically. It's, it's a completely like different. marathon runner, Correct. marathon runner, but and it's tell him. Eventually, eventually the, uh, technique, the technique is the same. So given enough time, he Lewis Hamilton could be competitive, uh, speed-wise, could be competitive uh, uh, at a level uh, in GT cars. Uh, at the same and because he has, he knows how to build. He knows the principle. He gets there very quickly. He might build it much faster. Than he gets there very quickly. This is, the this same time, is a very common the, at thing. the same extent, at the same extent, you take, uh, you take the top driver in GT cars currently. Pick your pick your pick, and you put him into a Formula One car. With enough time, with enough time, with, with enough More time. More difficult though. No, 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 absolutely not. With enough you time. You believe no? Because, no, because speed is uh, speed is uh, relative, in a sense that it's, uh, the Formula One car is much faster, but can go also much faster. Is the same say is the same people that saying, oh, like um, like uh, you drive a G- like you drive an, uh, like an SP whatever or a V4 car, and the GT3 cars are one and a half minute faster. And say, how much faster is the driver that is driving one and a half minute faster? Actually, arguably, sometimes slower because the car is built. Easier car even. The car is built to go one and a half minute faster. You know, the Formula One cars are doing the, those things because they are built to do those things. And uh, given enough time, a driver that is at peak of his game in a, in any f- form of driving competitively in circles uh, can be competitive uh, in this machinery. You see. Uh, for example, Grosjean, uh, he went to IndyCar, which is a very similar, is a very difficult, different machinery, and yet he's competitive right away. And uh, and this is uh, this is basically the principle. We, we go back, we go back to the same, to we go back to the same thing, in the sense that eventually there are a set of constraints built by physics, and you have to operate within those constraints. And once you understand the rules of the game. It's just about being accurate and uh, becoming so the difference between me and a driver that is better than me is that he's more accurate. So we are doing the same things, but he's a more accurate and the driver that is faster than him is even more accurate and the faster than, and the guy that is faster than him is even more accurate. So how do you become accurate is to 
do it more and more and more and more. And this is when we say that eventually nothing beats uh, seat time. And this is also why, to some extent, that uh, drivers that are currently in modern uh, simulators or whatever, like iRacing... They actually get seat time. Can, can, can get competitive in real life because while they are not experiencing the same thing, they are experiencing the same constraints in the sense that braking works... Although it's a different set of rules, but braking sort of works the same in, in, in iRacing or Assetto Corsa as it does in real life. So if you become very accurate with uh, using your pedals and using your steering input, this translates once to one. Because, of course, you could say, OK, if I am very good with Michelin, then I'm not very good with Pirelli's because the way the tire works and the shape of it, it's different. But in reality, a driver that is fast, he just has to learn. I want to go back to the original point, to the original point. So like, as I said, you being fast, being fast, yes, uh, uh, being fast is a prerequisite. So if you think that being fast is all you need, it is actually completely the opposite. So being fast is the bare minimum. Uh, I have never seen a professional driver that is slow. That he wasn't fast. So I, that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> Got it. So, okay, okay, okay. So I think this was a very interesting tangent by itself. And uh, it, for, especially for those of you that are not going to watch or hear the whole thing, at least now you know that the, why you being fast is not enough. And that this is not the only thing that you should bring on the table. I mean, it's Let's good go that back. you're fast, but... You know, of, co of course, of course. Uh, there is also a good possibility that you're not fast enough. But uh, le 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 let's, not, let's not break your dreams right now. Let's go back to your history gap, like, uh, like your specific story. So mm, you are there, well, you, did your, you, did your, you did your karting gears. Ah, yes. Uh, interesting thing, finished. Then you transitioned to cars. Yes. This sort of uh, reignited a little bit your uh, love about the thing. And uh, I will bring you exactly where I want this conversation to go. You decide to move to the Nürburgring. Right. And try for a second time. And since you know that uh, coming here just to race will not work, you find a different way to come in. I don't want to focus too much on this because I, I believe there's going to be another time that we discuss about this, like our common era. I, I would say we transition straight to the fact that we are here living at the ring, as many people before you did and as many people after you did. And you have to curve your own way to end up in a race car. So I want uh, to share like your personal angle, how you thought about it. I know that... Uh, it might be uh, that some people hear this and they think that we're just going to give them like a recipe. Uh, I will clarify ahead. There is no recipe. But let's... Yeah, exactly. I wanted to say this. Like, I, I, yeah. I have yet to distill the 100% uh, success rate uh, on, on how to become a race driver. I barely know how I made it. So for me, it only worked one way. So the only way I could, the only way I could see myself racing cars is if I would be paid to do it um, so for me even before it was a job it was a job and uh, and i never took it any other way uh, of course this doesn't mean that they got they paid me right away uh, but i can guarantee you i didn't put one euro out uh, so whenever they came um, and they wanted for money uh, it, this this was not the door the right door to knock on uh, eventually later in my career i had uh, sponsors that eventually even you could say that they decided for themselves what i should have done so it's not that i went to them and said hey i need this much to do this but they came to me and said hey we put this together so you're gonna do it um, eventually this is paid so like all my racing is paid uh, by somebody but not by me directly and not by my sponsor being my father or his cousin or his uh, or his friend's company, which is what most uh, what most racing um, which eventually by the way, requires happens to every every level of racing, including every level. Formula One, including Formula One, absolutely. Actually, Inclu very famously, by very the way, famously, very famously, when uh, Alonso went from McLaren to Ferrari, or I don't remember exactly. Eventually, the deal was sweetened by Santander following. Uh, so, like, he was being paid millions, but he brought with him he was already, sponsors. He was also already millions. a champion. Already he was already champion. a challenge. And, and, but, and, of course, you could say that, that Santander was proud of sponsoring him. So, it's not that Alonso went and said, please, can you give me some money? Of course, this is not how it went. But Santander paid 20, 30, 40, 50 millions to Ferrari or McLaren or whatever to have Alonso in the car. So, Alonso not in the car, Santander not on the car. So, and, and, and this is a sponsorship. Yeah, this is a sponsor. Correct. Of course, it's different Correct. different to the level that we are talking about. But of course, but, but, but I would say that, that the, the principle in the sense is, is the same. And it's also very important for people to understand that 
there is a reason that why we talk so much about the money in this, uh, in this, uh, the, especially when the closer we come to the higher level of raising, is because it is an extremely expensive activity. Yes. So, contrary to what you might think, even in the lowest VLN class, it's an extremely expensive activity. Well, well. Uh, okay, listen. Cars in general are expensive activity because Gabs, I know, I already know the argument. Gabs' argument is that, okay, building in a very fast uh, track car to come and do track days and be the first in the track day is also an expensive activity. So actually you could race. It's much more expensive and, than being like. Exactly. And we, we're going to finish, we're going to finish the podcast exactly with this. But uh, let me, let me also ask you something very important. Uh, what I noticed, and you said it earlier, uh, you approached it like work. Uh, what I noticed from the first race team, from the smaller race team that you started with, and I want you a little bit to give uh, to, the, to the guys that they don't know you like a timeline, but from the first race team that you worked with, I always noticed that one of the things that you had in your mind was not what, who I am, you know, to tell them like, I'm, I'm Gabriel Piana and I'm fast, I have done this, I have done that. The most important thing that I've seen in you is what you try to offer to them. So what do I bring on the table other than the fact that I'm fast? And I've noticed that in every single every single of the jumps that you did, you always try to put added value on the table. Different uh, types in different uh, situations. But I always felt that this was one of the key things that you always try to bring something extra on the table. Is this true? Is this, uh, did I feel yes. this right? It is, uh, it is absolutely true. And I think this is the key. Uh, I think this is what made it uh, for me possible up until here. And uh, it is still what makes it possible now. Uh, of course, I bring something else now to the table, but uh, this is uh, to, the extent, to some extent irrelevant in the sense that, you know, it might have sound entitled when I said, for me, racing cars only would work as a job. Like I would not want to do it as out of passion. But it, in reality... And also, when I said I never paid for racing, so in reality, it's this is this is true, but this is because I wanted to do it in a very specific. So I have a, I had a very specific vision in my mind, which is, uh, it is a business for them. So, if I was the owner of the team, why would I want this specific guy in the car that is not willing to pay, rather than? this other guy or that other guy or that other guy or that other guy or that other guy. So basically the bottom line was, would you hire yourself? So this was the, eventually the question. And uh, the question would be, of course, I would be happy to hire me if I bring more value than what I cost. And I would not want me if I bring more cost than what I'm valued. Um, Correct. And uh, eventually this is, how you, this is how I tackle the whole experience. Uh, so I remember when I... So I remember the first race, the first, first, first chance that I had was completely okay, like completely random and occasional. Uh, and I did it because, uh, because uh, you know, uh, naive, naively, I thought uh, this could give me a, like, a, like a chance or a break, which in reality, this was a proof of concept to, to the opposite in a sense that it was a proof of concept that if you just go in and try and drive quick, even if you are quick, there was somebody quicker than you before uh, because of circumstances, because no matter how quick you are going to be, your first time is not going to be the fastest they've ever seen. And even if it is the fastest they've ever seen, they're still probably going to play it down to circumstances. Uh, they're going to remember you maybe, but eventually they're going to need money. So this is not what they, they have plenty of a little bit slower drivers that are paying good money. So they don't need you. They don't need you and your extra half a second. They don't need it, uh, especially at this level of racing. So I had to find another way to go to get into it. And the other way was to basically uh, say to the guy, hey, uh, I'm going to make your customer faster. And they were not interested in that either. So they said, okay, I'm going to make your customer safer. And this, this was actually better. Uh, this they reacted a little bit better to. Um, uh, so eventually uh, I started in 2015 uh, doing some RCN coaching because in RCN you can coach. Uh, eventually it worked very well. Uh, the customers were happy with the feedback. They, they were a bit quicker. They were a lot safer. Cars were not being damaged. Uh, and the team wanted to pay me. Uh, and uh, they, they really wanted to pay me to be in the car, to be coaching in the car. And I said, no, no, you, I don't want money. Uh, so you don't need to pay me. Uh, I don't want any money from you. Um, you just remember uh, when you have a chance, just remember my name, you have my number, you know what I want to do. Because I told them, this is what I want to do with my life, but I know that you cannot give me this, so I will do something else for you. 
And then if there is a chance, you know, or maybe you remember me, maybe you don't, maybe it takes one year, maybe it takes six months, maybe it takes two weeks, who knows. Uh, and then, of course, I went home saying, oh, thinking I'm the smartest guy in the world. This guy is going to call me tomorrow. And it didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, it didn't, and, and eventually I did a few months like this. But, of course, then back then, months felt like years. But um, if you think back, it's like a few days eventually. Uh, so a few months of this and then eventually the chance came uh, with the same team. And I even picked this team to go I, and propose myself as a, as an added value, uh, as a tool to keep the car safe, because this was the team that was winning the most amount of races in those, in those classes. And uh, I sort of knew that uh, they could probably spare the budget for a fast guy if they needed, and uh, because the budgets are small, and they knew they were competitive. So this created the circumstances in my head that if I had the chance to be in one of their cars, I also had the chance to showcase something because the cars were there and they were competitive. Um, so it started, a, lot of us, a lot of stars had to align, but uh, the design was clear in my head. And um, eventually I got, uh, I got a chance. I got a chance and uh, I got one race with them with uh, one of their worst cars and uh, it was like a six hour race and i think there were like five drivers or something like this or it was a four hour race with four drivers so something crazy where you barely drive um i still uh, i still were gl- uh, grateful and um uh, this also was very important then because i needed my permit uh so this is how i got my b permit so this i could do vln and in vln i got this first race and then there were they were, I think they were not unhappy, but they said, ah, yeah, okay, there's a guy. So like, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, he didn't crash. So this is, the, this is how they reacted because... He's not one per- of them. <laughs> the performance, the performance, they didn't even measure. Like the performance, the, the performance didn't even measure on the scale. Like the scale group goes from zero to 100, but this was in a class that nobody was even checking. So the car had to just start and finish. That's the only thing they needed to do. Um, car finished, the guy's okay. Good, I got to finish might, the team. We, we, okay. we might call him. We might call him one more. We time. might call him again. Yeah, exactly. And then, they, then, they, then, uh, not the next race, but the, the race after. So the season was finishing, and the next race after, they put me into. Um, they put me with a fast with one of their fast guys already. And uh, so with one of their fast guys and another guy, uh, I don't remember. They put me in a car that was uh, completely new to me. Like back then, back then, of course, every car was new to me. Uh, but um, it was uh, it was the first year of the 235i cup it was a very fiercely fiercely contested class with uh, some big talents in it among which uh, current bmw factory driver uh, jesse Krohn. and uh, so uh, it was a it was a tough class and uh, the first time it didn't really go super smoothly in the sense that the car was very weird so the car is very weird it requires a lot of confidence and uh, a lot of uh, it doesn't it doesn't have a, it doesn't give a lot of feedback so you just have to know and you go and go of course without testing and without driving difficult to know and uh, my performance was okay again was an okay performance which in hindsight if you think it's my third race and i'm racing against people that are racing the whole season it was uh, it was very you good you were up there it was very oh. good, but it was very good, but it's not groundbreaking. So you're not setting the timing screens on fire. You're not putting lap records or anything. So I said, "Fuck, just actually, yet. actually, I said, ah, okay, the- this was really struggle. I, I struggled a little bit, and I didn't feel particularly comfortable because it, I wasn't even the faster in the car. I wasn't, the, I wasn't even the fastest guy in the car. I think the other guy was faster, and this was uh, a little bit difficult to accept at that time, but." Uh, because everybody thinks it's the best, like uh, you cannot escape from it. And uh, and this, I really felt like, I, oh, maybe I'm not that good. So uh, anyway, I had to be patient. I didn't get a chance the next race. But then in the last race of the season, uh, which is uh, actually, no, no, the second to last race of the season then, uh, I got another call. So the guy called me and said, hey, look, I have these two customers. The car is fully paid. I need a third driver. Come. And again, it was a 235i, and uh, back then, at that time, um, I was also, you know, among the values that I was bringing to the team. Uh, I had a few guys that wanted to race and test race cars, and I would all tell them, look, I'm not a hustler. I don't want any money. I don't want to cut anything from this. I don't want to skim the glass. This is the name of the driver. This is the contact of the team. 
you guys talk to each other directly you agree on a price you team get the best price you want you driver get the best price you can i don't want anything to do with it i can be there i can help you uh to to if you need to speak or if you need to you know if there is a problem you can call me i'm there available and this is why i would go to vlns um, with a friend of mine that was racing but i wouldn't be racing like i wouldn't be only helping him and uh, if there were questions and uh, i would do it free of charge like uh, i know that the vast majority of drivers that also uh, handle this kind of things they all take a cut uh, this is the standard procedure but i said to the team i don't need any cut earn the most amount of money you can and i went to my guy and i said try to get the best price you can and everybody both parties were happy the only one get getting getting fucked potentially is me but i'm okay with it um because there is uh, an end goal an end goal and there is, exactly because there is a, there is a couple another, of hundred of euros i have another i have another idea in my mind and uh, eventually like this again another another chance happened to come and uh, this one was different and uh, i don't know what happened but uh, it was different like uh, i had time to look over what i did uh, in the video with the car the the, the, the races before and uh, i wasn't happy so i was really motivated to get better so i did a lot of work and uh, and uh, yeah, I think it was my second race in the 235i and I did the lap record on the Notch Life. <laughs> and I had very limited experience on the Notch Life also. So like I probably With had... people uh, racing these cars almost for a full season by that. Correct. By that, by so that it, was, uh, it was, again, it was down to circumstances in the sense that everything had to align. I probably took, like if I look back at that video now, knowing what I know now, I say you're an idiot because probably, you know, I didn't have the skill set that I have now. And... Uh, I might actually go slower now in this instance. So now, in the same circumstances, I would be going slower. Uh, but um, uh, you take a lot of risks. And uh, and then uh, this eventually... I remember you know, this I, lap to this day, by the way. Yeah? I remember the lap. I remember even... Uh, I remember when the guy in the radio told me, uh, do you know what... Uh, it's like what just happened? The, like uh, like uh, you cross the finish line and they tell you the lap time. And they say, but you have a lap timer in the car. And they say, and they say, do you know what lap time did you just do? And I said, uh, no, the lap timer is not working. So the lap timer was the beacon wasn't working. And I said, okay, okay, don't worry, go on. So like, uh, and uh, and uh, and I I knew then that it mustn't. I mean, they don't radio this. It's, if you're it shouldn't have been. It's not exactly. bad. It's a bad thing. <laughs> so and then when I came back into the pits, they told me I did the lap record and here and that. And this 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 was very cool. They were all very excited. Eventually, the lap record got beaten like straight after, but uh, that from another driver. But this is irrelevant. So uh, for for I, a moment, for a moment, and basically in your second time in the car, uh, correct. You put uh, so, so basically, and this clearly, from clearly the same made a difference for the team. Correct. The same evening they said, uh, "Okay, next year you're gonna be racing. Uh, you're gonna be racing for us and not with us, which is a very different." The, the thing. start of what we are discussing. It's video. the start. It was the start of 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 my racing career, which is uh, fascinating. Uh, this was 2015. This was end of 2015, and then I did one more VLN for them, but uh, my teammate crashed, so uh, we didn't. I didn't do one single lap. Part but I remember. But I remember. I remember that uh, and. Uh, and none of this I paid for. So like none of these tests, races, whatever you want to call them, I had to pay for because the team was happy to have me here because I would do, I would work. So like I would work for them. So I would generally work for no pay to get the seat in. And this is a, a very inspiring story uh, uh, I heard was that one of, one of my close friends that lives close to me also now, it's much older than me, but he's a very close friend. And uh, he used to be Pirelli testing, uh, test, uh, like tire testing, like head of or whatever. And we went to Bridgestone, etc. And he started washing the, f the floors at Pirelli. So like he literally said, I want to do this. What can I do? Like he went there and said, I want to do it. What can I do? To start and he said you can wash the floors <laughs> and he started washing the floors and i think this is a, this is something that is that i always say to myself a lot of time because i think i am not so committed to working so like i really don't like working uh, in general like uh, <laughs> uh, uh, like i am a, no no my attitude is a bit my attitude is a bit but i'm so great why don't you realize this should, this should not be the video uh okay i think i think we're getting in, into the most interesting part of the video because uh I think the majority of people clicked in the title because they want to know how to make money out of racing. And yeah. uh, I have to tell you one cliches. Normally, they're very good because 
they are most of the time truth. So the the only way to make like a small fortune out of racing is to it's start, to start with, with a big one. one. You have heard this one? It's a hundred percent right. So the the point of this video was not how Gab actually become uh, like a rich man doing racing. No, also because absolutely I'm not. not. <laughs> exactly. But it is it is to explain is to explain actually exactly this uh, this sort of quite uh, simple small steps how important they are and how interconnected they are because if not all these things would align you know no, none of what we are about to discuss uh, would happen yeah yeah so yeah it's basically, very down to chance a lot of it is still down to chance but I, the thing is that while it is down to chance so i want to say something of course as i said you might go to the mountain but it all the stars have to align and they they have to align more than once actually to keep going up they might have to align 20 times and the difference between you have actually to work breaking, very hard you have, you to, have work to work very hard, hard. And it, there is a chance there is a chance that it might not work out at the end and uh, but this is with everything in life and racing is not different and uh, but i think what i what i really um, in in my years although i'm these are not so many but in my years i've seen many 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 people being given chances just as good as mine or even better than mine and fucking them up. So like, and, and and this is and not fucking them up by chance or by bad luck, by fucking them up because they didn't believe in it, they didn't take it, or they didn't deliver. Because this is also a thing. Like, uh, of course, I was lucky, especially if you can, if you look at 2016 and something, and stuff like that. I was I was very lucky. Like, uh, like in, in 2016, I I started VLN, and in the class, uh, I started winning the class with my teammates. And we were we were leading the championship. We were going for the championship. Then we had some bad luck late in the season, but this didn't matter. But this created the opportunity for me to connect with uh, Marek from Race Navigator, and he was starting a team, and he took me in, and we did Porsche Sports Cup. I have never I had never driven a car a Porsche car before in my life on a racetrack, and we went to the first weekend in Hockenheim, and we did uh, P1 in a free practice qualifying race, and like everything. This cannot so, be luck though. Uh, so like uh, there is a lot of hard work. Uh, so there is a lot on of the wheel, on the wheel. Uh, I mean there is a lot of hard work, and then uh, and then of course. It's like, and then it's, it's, uh, it's, it is, it is like I had teammates, like I had with me, I wasn't alone. There was a second car and the second car was doing endurance races at that time. Like it was a two hour race and he had a good chance. So he, my teammate had just as good of a chance to become whatever he wanted to be as mine. He had the same tools. He actually had better tools because he was more established by then. He had more experience and he was more established, but his attitude on track like his attitude like the fact that whenever something wrong happened he became defensive and it wasn't his fault and uh, it was somebody else's fault and it was the mechanics fault and it was the, the competitors fault so this kind of attitude put him immediately on a back foot because uh, every lesson i could learn from he for him it was just a knock on the head so everything that was going wrong for him it was twice as hard as for me and i actually i was when something happened was happening to him i was learning for myself and uh, and when yeah. something happened to him he was just complaining that Guys, uh, why this, this is, is happening this is a huge lesson and you can take it also for any track driving and i would even tell you you can take it about anything in life but uh, specifically for driving on the track the guy that actually has a an accident or something happens and he will blame everything but himself and then the next time We'll do exactly this, and then the next time, exactly this. He's the guy that he's gonna plateau the quicker, and uh, you don't really even have to have an accident. Like when you go out there and the performance is not there, and it's yeah, the yeah, it's, and then it's you go out there problem, yeah. and the performance is not there. It's a setup. It is a, the it's pressure, a setup. Right? exactly, the, exactly. The traffic, exactly. And, this and, and you that. can apply this to track days, to time attack events, to endurance racing, to big race cars, small race cars. So normally, this is not how you improve it's uh, but this is uh, i i i have to give uh, i have to give my father credit where credit is due because uh, he i was involved in a lot of crashes when i was karting like and i mean a lot a lot I of see. them i can uh, see <laughs> so uh and uh, for me I, it was never my fault like i uh, i would i would get out i would get off of it of whatever was left and i would say I, can, I, I couldn't avoid it. And, and he would say, yeah, of course you could have avoided it. You should not have been there in the first place. And I said, what do you mean? Well, you know, this morning you, your head wasn't in the right place. You qualified 12th. 
you know what happens in the midfield, everything can crashes, everybody crashes, you should have qualified on pole. You see, the pole man is winning the race. He didn't have this, he didn't have this problem. It's your fault. You're not quick enough in qualifying. So, of course, this was very hard. Like, of course, when you're 12 or 13, team, but... this is a very hard lesson to hear, especially week in, week out. But eventually this sort of stick and uh, and uh, and this is how I live my life. Like, uh, if I get... If I get, if I go on a club, like this is a completely theoretical example, I go on a club and I get drunk and I get stopped by the police while thousands of others don't get stopped. I don't complain that I'm unlucky. So like, I don't complain, oh, but other thousand didn't get stopped. Cause and said, effect. Exactly. You did something and then something, something else happened. So I'm very, I'm very, I'm very unhappy because I thought that this story was go, would go somewhere else. So you said like, I'm going out in a club and my, my brain started already traveling somewhere else. Okay. 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 Uh, let's <laughs> no. keep it into cars, into cars then. Uh, so this is still fantastic. You are uh, 2016. You are doing sports cup. You are in your first time of ever in a Porsche race car. But uh, the coolest things are yet to come. So basically, what follows? No, oh, this was already super cool because by then I already uh, so I had uh, one of my main uh, teammates and uh, you could say sponsors uh, of my career, which is uh, my friend Mehmet, uh, which I coached him on road cars for years. And then in 2016 he decided I want to race with you. And the stars aligned and I said, okay, I know the perfect team. I'm already racing there. And uh, basically in my first year of full VLN, I was driving two cars, which is insane. Like uh, it was my first year of racing fully, full, full time. And I was driving already two cars. I was double starting uh, VLN. And uh, I would do one class. I would do position in one car, get out, go into the other. And one is like paddle shift and left foot braking. And the other one is a manual gearbox with clutch and everything. And you go for out of one and into the other. And you do position in two classes. And everybody in the team is fucking losing his mind. It was a great time. Great time to be alive. Um, and then on top of this, I'm doing sports cup uh, with, uh, with Marek and his team. And uh, of course, the performance was there, but uh, it was back to cutting days, I could say. And uh, I had a couple of uh, a couple of uh, hits, and uh, that, that that weren't really necessary. Um, partly because of uh, a fault of the of the equipment, but partly because of me wanting a little bit too much and getting a little bit frustrated. Uh, so that stopped. Um, so I did my finished my VLN season and uh, hoped for the best for 2017. And uh, who knew what 2017 would bring? Because 2017, uh, my second year of racing in cars, I will be going straight to Carrera Cup, which is completely insane. Uh, the most, uh, uh, the most, um, the most competitive. A dream for many, yeah. Uh, a dream for many, and the most competitive uh, championship, uh, arguably, in the world. And uh, this is a testament. So n- back then, I was re- it was a really frustrating year. But now. I look back at it and I look at I look back at it uh, like with good memories because one it was epic, uh, two, uh, two it was a testament to how much people believed in me, uh, which is probably a bit too much. Uh, but uh, um, you know my exploit until then uh, they were so eventually exceptional to to some of them that they believed I could go I could reach uh, whatever and uh, eventually this didn't become true because. Uh, you be, eventually you start you start competing. You are being people. a bit too humble. Uh, no, no, you start, I mean, you start I mean, competing. You start competing to the you start competing with the with the best of the best in the world. Like not not a VLN in a car, guys, guys, not, guys. I'm sorry. I, I'm just going to because many people they are not familiar with the cars. Uh, we are talking now about transitioning basically in your second full year of racing to a car that has no ABS and is particularly tricky to drive. And some of yeah. these drivers had experience doing Carrera Cup for years. So I would no, my say, teammate was Christian Engelhardt. <laughs> Correct. So I would say, I don't say it in a bad way, but in, in a way, you maybe not even ever had the possibility to do it. Okay, maybe you could pull like uh, something out of your sleeve and you could you could have the pace, but theoretically... Oh, yeah, I, had should... I, I, exactly, I had exactly. it sometimes. I had it sometimes. Exactly, exactly, exactly. But like, I just wanted for, for example, for people... because the problem is that this championship, the car is very particularly particular to drive. I, I don't want to go too much into details because then this, this podcast will be like five hours. But I, I, the, the car is very difficult to drive. It, I never had experience with a car without ABS and the cup car without ABS is, is twice as hard as any other car without ABS. So, um, uh, and uh, it was a huge step for me and uh, a very big one. And of course, if you look at my ID, at my age, you know, I was there with the other, but the other people, they never stopped racing. So they started with me with the eight and they were now 28 and they've been racing 20 years and I've been racing two years. 
and this is a bit of a gap that uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to close entirely. Although I would finish uh, a couple of times in top five, and I in, and finally enough, you see, like in Norris Ring, which is a track where people could not go and test. And Norris Ring was my most competitive outing because there you need to improvise a little bit more, and I was I actually down to luck, but I, I actually out-qualified my teammate Christian Engelhardt, which is arguably one of the fastest men that ever lived in a cup car. So uh, exactly. there were, 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 were flashes. We were watching as spectators. We were watching as spectators and we were extremely proud of you. So I, I, I think... There were, flashes, there, were flash, there were flashes of success, but uh, eventually... Um, Eventually, there was a lot at stake, and uh, I knew how much at stake it was. So I also had like some. I, I was a bit restrained because I couldn't afford to do like the team could not afford me to do to do damage, and uh, this didn't help also with the confidence. But the thing is that it was a huge uh, learning curve, and uh, uh, the more you know, the less you know, right? So I thought I was good, and then I went to Canada Cup and I said, "Oh fuck, I'm a bit shit," uh, and. Um, but like I'm talking like few tenths from uh, current uh, current uh, you know LMP1 future LMP1 drivers from Porsche. So like everything like in respect, uh, if I look back at it, I, I'm very proud of what I have achieved because uh, it I, it was an ex I believe it was an exceptional performance given the circumstances. Uh, but uh, of course, if you look at the piece of paper, it was just above average, which is still fucking something to me. But uh, it's uh, it was what it was. At the same time. Uh, and what followed, I, though, was actually even cooler in my yes, opinion. Yes, because at that time I was uh, I was uh, rated as bronze um, because of my little experience. And then uh, Black Falcon, which I was racing for in Canada Cup, decided to give me a chance in uh, Blanc Pan, straight, like second year of racing, Blanc Pan. <laughs> and um, and uh, I went to Paul Ricard, and one of my teammates was Maro Engel. I don't know if you know him. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, uh, quick uh, Google search. But so, uh, if you're following this channel, you should. So uh, yeah, I, I think uh, th this was a, that was brilliant that weekend because uh, I didn't know anything, so I went in con with a completely open mind. Uh, I remember that they put me in to drive in drive shafts to get me to know the car a bit, and uh, I think in the race I was quicker uh, than Maro in a sector, so everybody lost their mind. Like, how is this guy driving at this level? It's impossible. Uh, which is impossible. It was completely down to to, to luck and down to the help that Maro gave me at that day. Um, uh, and then this, I really appreciated the fact that he was humble and uh, helped me throughout. And uh, of course, this led me to be in the Spa 24 hour that year. So my second year of racing in cars, I was driving a GT3 car in the Spa 24 hour, uh, which is insane. Of course, I sucked balls like a bastard, uh, but... <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I really, I was really slow there. Uh, but of course, it was so much, and I, really, I was so scared of driving or destroying the car, and uh, uh, everything was new. It was very difficult, very difficult conditions, and uh, it was a, probably the most difficult race I've ever done. My first 24 hours of spa. I mean, I was slow, but I wasn't like slow, like uh, amateur slow. Like I was slower than they wanted me to be, but uh, I was still, I was still competitive. But I underdelivered, let's say. So the year went on like this. I did my Carrera Cup season, uh, and then, uh, and yeah, and then 2018 came and went, uh, and 2018 was uh, the breakout year, you could say. Uh, Black Falcon confirmed me for the whole Blankman season again, and. Uh, and also for uh, VLN and N24 Hour on a GT3, and uh, which was a fantastic thing. And at the same time, I would be driving a GT4 with my with my with my friend Mehmet as well. So again, double starting and everything. And uh, it was a busy year. It was a successful year. It was a frustrating year sometimes because Blanc Pen is very competitive. So um, and of course, given that uh, all of this was happening with no financial backing you are always on the line in the sense that uh, there is you're people, there. You have there, your is contract, people but... there is people like you they say they would come to me and say why do i have to have you in the car like there is this guy that is paying one that is willing to pay 100,000 euros and look he's one tenth faster than you or one tenth slower than you and you could say yes but you know since i'm not paying I'm not driving anything in free practice and I'm not doing anything in testing so of course I'm not as fast as I could be because you don't let me 
But this is a, if you get to that point of discussing it, you're already losing. You're already out. So I just uh, put my head down, did my best. Uh, we win. We won Dubai 24 hour. Uh, I was that the was a great guy. start of the year. Or? I was the fastest guy in my car also. Even there, a little bit of luck. Our sister car retired. That could have gave us a hard time, but um, they retired. So we won. We won the six hour uh, via land that year. Yeah, uh, that was we, crazy. we won Silverstone in Blanc Pen in Silver Cup. Uh, we led the championship in Silver Cup easily the whole year until uh, we, we had a DNF at the end that costed us the championship. So we finished P2 in the championship, but it was a very successful season. The first 24 hours in a GT3, I was leading the, the, the car. I was the only, we were the only non-factory car. And uh, like in the top five, we finished P5 as the only non-factory car back there. Uh, it was a very successful year. It was a very difficult year financially for me because I wasn't, I was a lot on the road, but I wasn't getting paid so much. Uh, among all this, I was also doing GT4 European Series, which was very successful um, uh, with my teammate uh, Razvan back then. Uh, and uh, yeah, eventually I, I scored enough points to also win eventually at the end of the year, the internal AMG championship. Um, which I did, and this led eventually to the factory contract from AMG in 2019, where I would do the same thing, like Blanc Pen, uh, VLN, 24 hours, and etc. Plus, on the side again, the uh, GT4 European season, and this has pretty much been my standard program every every year, every other year since. I would say so. For me, this is exactly why I said that I consider your story a success story. Because, because uh, in four years from uh, exactly. one VLN to AMG exactly, factory driver. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Of course, uh, people have to understand that there is a lot of things before. This is why we start with your karting years. And there is a lot of things that followed after and even in between. However, if you separate this, you know, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not crazy to say that you basically started from having no experience to any of these kind of race cars. Mm -hmm. and actually, no race experience at all on the Nürburgring, like the most difficult track in the world one could say and uh, literally in three se three racing seasons four years and three racing seasons you managed to arrive to a factory contract which is uh, also what we put on the title of this video so you arrived to a factory contract it doesn't mean that you made it still sure there is a, a lot of a lot it's of quite the opposite exactly but 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 one could theoretically say that arriving to the possibility to have a factory contract which is something that a very small number of drivers managed to do could actually mean that you made it and you are a paid race driver. Of course, there is many other ways that race drivers make money, but for me, this is a fantastic story. I don't know if people that they don't follow like the all these racing series, they might not realize that some of your teammates are uh, top drivers of any GT3 series, like the, the people that the companies bring here to race VLN, you know, this is not like a small local championship. Uh, Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, no, they no. bring some of, of their the best drivers they have. Top, top drivers of our times. So, uh, of course, you say my performance at Spa sucked, okay, and people might think that uh, you are like a backmarker. Absolutely not. And your teammates were uh, people like Maro and people like Manuel, you know, and all these very fast guys. We are talking about uh, the, the sister cars had fantastic drivers. Uh, some of them actually won the 24-hour race. The, the competing cars had fantastic drivers. Uh, yeah. In the 24-hour race, the first 20 cars, the lineup is epic, like XF1 drivers, guys like that you know, like Kevin Nestre, Maro Engel that uh, Gab mentioned earlier on, you know, like he's the guy that actually did the AMG record that maybe you have seen. So maybe if you are too focused on road cars, maybe you don't know all these names, but we're talking about top-level drivers. And uh, the majority of these people, as Gab said, they started racing at eight and they continued. So they might have like the similar age, you know, but <laughs> they actually raced all the, all these years. So Unfortunately, yes. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting with my, I'm fighting with a hand tightened behind my head, by my back. So Gab, if we try to condense everything for those guys that they're not going to watch this whole one hour and they're really going to come to the end of the video, no problem, no hard feelings, we will be the same. No, exactly. For the young drivers out there, or even if you had a son tomorrow, you know, like if you were your father. If, if you you're watching, star, you have a kid that wants to go racing. <laughs> this, is, this is the information that you want to know. So what advice would you give to that young kid? And also what advice you, would you give to the father as well? Because it's equally important. To go karting as soon as possible, put him in our go-kart and uh, don't care if he's winning or if he's last. Let him uh, just experience the thing. Uh, have a keen eye, I would say, have a, the keenest eye possible if he's really liking it or if he's just doing it because you want it. Um, 
if you want it, then stop right away. Uh, if he if he wants it, let him do. Um, eventually, winning in cutting is totally overestimated, especially if you don't want. Um, if you if your goal is to be Formula One, then maybe. But even then, um, you don't necessarily have to win multiple world championships to be in Formula One. Uh, just let him be cutting. Let me let him be doing cutting. Let him learn his skill set and then put him into cars. Of course, this will require a lot of money, and uh, the the angle that I would take would be the same: is that I would try to shape him into a young man that can give something back to the team, beside being a fast idiot. Because there are fields full of fast idiots, uh, and most of them have more have more money than you have. Uh, so. Um, just try to teach him. It, it, I might be even go as far as to say that it's not the end of the world if he goes racing a little bit later in his life. I would say that uh, for me, one of the most uh, important things that you said multiple times through this hour, and I have seen you put in practice, is uh, never stop actually improving. Never stop to be harsh with yourself. Sometimes it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit difficult as you go through the experiences, but try to be as critical as possible with yourself. There is uh, nothing wrong from pushing yourself to improve in, in any situation. Even when you think you arrived, there is always a little bit more. And if things uh, don't align and you don't manage to arrive where you want, it's not the end of the world. So try to not be result oriented, but try right, to work process for these results. Exactly. So, so try to put yourself in situations that you can be lucky. So because we talked about luck and you need luck and you need luck, but you need to be at the right place to be lucky for the things to happen. So Correct. it's not just luck. Uh, this is uh, what I would say. I think that there's some fantastic uh, advice uh, if people actually watch through this whole thing. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it is a little bit of uh, like a one-sided story. So I don't know if I would care of watching so long, uh, hearing some guy I, I barely know. But um, yeah, I mean, I look, it's not rocket science. Eventually, just like driving, the idea is very simple. Uh, putting it, putting it, putting it into practice is fucking complicated in the sense that it is very simple. As Costa said, uh, focus on the process and not focus on the result. Try to be the best, uh, the best version you can in the field that you want to be excelling into, and uh, so this means being hard on yourself, but try to be at the same time. Try to remember that this is not uh, the end of it all. So uh, there are other things in life that are also important. I give you an example. For example, uh, we are talking about, uh, we talked about briefly about Lewis Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton, as soon as he started, uh, you know, going out with Rihanna and designing clothes and whatnot, people said this is the end of Lewis Hamilton. All these things that not... you are criticizing him for. This you is the end of Lewis. There. This is the end of Lewis Hamilton. This is he's not. His head is not in the right place. He's not focusing on his job. And yet, this is his. This is his secret weapon. Best Be- years. Because because if you only focus, and this is a, this is maybe something that I would mention that I would try to make. I would try to avoid with my son, for example, that if if he's focusing on it so much that a bad weekend ruins his week, he's doing it wrong. So, bad weekend ends. Life goes on and you have a good life and then you go again into the next weekend with a fresh head. If the only thing you care about, the only thing that motivates you, the only thing that matters in life for you is that racing weekend, I can guarantee you that as soon as if the stuff if stuff is going well, it's fantastic. But as soon as you have a bad weekend or a bad season, your whole life goes to shit. And this is where Hamilton really really turned a corner and left everybody behind because he has a bad weekend he doesn't care he he doesn't care not because he doesn't care about his work he doesn't care because he knows that his life is more than formula one so he can go back the next weekend with a fresh refreshed head going in working hard and executing the job and without having the pressure to having to execute his job for himself because he knows that if you don't execute then the next weekend is just gonna be shit so it's 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 like you know like it's like when you have to do something because uh, the next paycheck will pay your food then the way you execute your work is much different than if you say my food is paid for i will try to execute the best job i can and this is this is the same attitude you should have to this 
and if you want to become an extremely professional uh, extremely proficient race driver much better than i will ever be just it is a job but when it's finished it's finished your life goes on and you have your family you have your friends you have your passions that are Actually, beyond what racing. what gab is trying to say is if you want to be a better race driver or a better cyclist or a better everything you have to be a balanced human being Correct. after all in order to perform at your ultimate best and i think that is the beautiful advice to finish this off uh, if you guys want to see more videos of this nature which uh probably you will not and i expect this to be like one of the least populars uh, but, oh, but we can still, have like I, uh, we pro can please have like... prove me wrong please prove me wrong <laughs> okay please, and please we come back prove us prove us wrong uh, watch this video share it with your friends uh remember to uh we said it many times because we should mention it remember to subscribe and like this video uh, hit that button there. Hit that button the bottom. there. Comment and uh, whatever. Comment you under. Do. If you have questions, exactly. ask them. And uh, it's a it's exactly. a safe it's a safe space. Ask them. Correct. This is just a primer, so you understand a little bit also with who you are speaking with. So if you watch this and this series, and you were particularly angry with Gab about this and that, now you also know a little bit more about the person and what is his racing background. So it's not like he did three spec Miata races and that's that. He has actually done a couple of things, and uh, I hope that this is also a little bit of a like a, like a space that you get to know us a little bit more, and you get to know at least how we did it because we clearly cannot give you a perfect recipe. Sometimes even the drivers that have a 60 year career, they struggle to tell you that this was that. Uh, but but they are all hard you know workers. I can get exactly. And, 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 and there are for sure values that can translate uh, for everyone. Uh, this is a long one. Uh, let's finish this I'm off. Sorry for it. See you on the next one. No? See you on the next one, Costas. Thank you very much.